ladies and gentlemen and uh, welcome to this session that we begin with on the third day of the ipc conference and uh, this is a very important session we shall be talking about integration of palliative care in non oncological settings and as we are all aware palliative care began its history with cancer and it has traditionally been associated not only with just end of life but with cancer as well and we are all striving hard to change this perception especially amongst our colleagues and to increase the reach to non oncological diseases as well and as uh, all of us in palliative care are aware that there's a huge need for ncds so for people who have uh, chronic incurable illnesses like hiv or organ failures with kidney disease or lung disease or uh, neurological disease and with the great population that we have which is aging now uh, there's a huge need in geriatrics as well so this session will focus specifically on early integration of palliative care in these diseases apart from cancer i will invite dr ashish mazumdar from balco hospital raipur to be the moderator for this session and he will introduce our chairperson of the day dr lalit kumar raigar so over to ashish please yeah good morning madam good morning everybody uh i am dr ashish majumdar from balco medical center uh, raipur chatisgarh and uh, i would like to introduce our eminent chairman for today's session uh, professor lalit kumar raigar and professor uh, lalit kumar raigar is uh, presently uh, uh, working as a senior professor in the department of uh, anesthesiology rnt in the rnt medical college udaipur and he also holds the uh, uh, position of additional principal uh, in that same college and he has a vast uh, teaching experience of more than 25 years in rnt medical college uh, udaipur he has several publications in his name he has authored few books uh, and uh, several chapters in uh, uh, few books and uh, he holds uh, several uh, uh, office positions in uh, Uh, various uh, 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 national uh, bodies and uh, he is the uh, he is on one of the editorial member board member of indian journal of anesthesiology and uh, general of clinical anesthesia and uh, he has uh, received several national and uh, state awards and uh, i would like to uh, hand over to professor uh, raigar for introduction of our chair uh, our speakers for this session thank you dr majumdar to introduce me i congratulate dr anjum jord for a nice organization and we are here for the third day morning session i introduce now the first speaker that is michael silverman Michael Silverman is chief of geriatrics and extended care and hospice West Palm Department of Eternal Affairs, West Palm Beach. He is presently working at Veteran Administration Medical Center, West Palm Beach, Florida. Area of interest is palliative medicine. In his name, he has made achievements that is. George Pfeff teaching awards as the outstanding geriatric educator of 2020 Miller School of Medicine University of Miami School of Medicine he has many publication in international and national journal our second speaker is Dr Pankaj Singhal a young person presently affiliated with kasturba medical college manipal he is working as an assistant professor in department of palliative medicine and supportive care the area of interest is integrative palliative care renal supportive care he has major achievement as a gold medalist in bruce davis ihp international travel scholars in his name and honored as a lead author renal supportive care supplement in ijpc 
In continuity, our third speaker is Dr. Sunita Daniel. Dr. Sunita Daniel is holding FRCP. Presently, she is working as a specialist medical. She is working as a specialist medical officer. Presently affiliated with National Health Mission General Hospital, Irankulam, and Hull York Medical School, UK. With a clinical experience of 20 years in internal medicine and 10 years in palliative medicine, her area of interest are psych oncology, breathlessness, cancer screening, and along with that, associated with education training resource development. In her name, achievement is he has done PhD in psychological symptoms, as well as honored as Dorothy Robson first prize for best paper in 2021, along with that, so many publication in her credits. Our fourth speaker is Dr. Savita Domai. She is medical consultant at Salon Palliative Unit of Enamel Hospital Association, Delhi. And our last speaker is Dr. Vivek Nirbhavne. He is head of clinical services and palliative care physician, Sipla Palliative Care and Training Center, Pune. Also, he is faculty in various training programs at institutes, which include Indian Association of Palliative Care, six weeks full-time training course, IACA. These are the all speakers. Now I invite Dr. Michael Silverman to give his speech. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. My name is Dr. Silverman. Welcome to everyone. Namaste to all. Uh, I'll present a little case to begin with. We have a, one of our uh, patients here, a 92-year-old Navy veteran. He submitted to our hospice front of life care suffered from low vision, hearing loss, depression, insomnia, had a lot of anger and uncontrolled pain, and we treated with high doses of morphine, but he was aloof and did not interact much with the hospice staff. He was very anxious and complaining of pain all over and uh, was not relieved by the morphine and lorazepam. He was thought to be a far risk and mats were placed at the side of his bed. He was seen by the hospice chaplain. He told the story that he was guilty and shamed by what happened 70 years before in World War II when a group of soldiers rioted on the ship he was on as a crewman because of inadequate provisions. And they began to throw each other overboard to their deaths. The veteran B was very depressed with this and had suffered for many years. We refer to this as moral injury, which is associated with significant spiritual distress. Uh, the veteran suffered uh, what we call also later adulthood trauma reengagement. And he was seen by the chaplain and uh, he was able to reengage with his past. Next slide, please. He seemed more at ease after telling the story, and he died a comfortable death physically and spiritually. Next slide, please. This case brings to bear a number of issues that we have to deal with every day when we take care of very old people and older people who are admitted to hospice. Because in addition to the hospice hours, we have to deal the geriatric aspects. And so what we do overall is what we call a geriatric assessment to look at all of these separate areas to determine where there are issues. And I've listed here a number of what we see in geriatric assessment, vision, hearing problems, function, 
pain, mobility, frailty, caregiver burden, a delirium. Next slide. Cognition, nutrition, social isolation, bereavement, income problems, polypharmacy, sleep, and pressure injuries. A number of these you don't have to worry about in younger people, but in older people, we need to be concerned about them and understand them as part of the process. And we're going to discuss that today based on looking at the individual that we just presented with his number of problems that are related to geriatrics. Next slide, please. Let's start with vision. You know, when we walk into a room, a uh, younger person, you don't usually have to worry, but with an older individual, you see a number of changes with vision, starting with a decrease in lens elasticity and weakening of ciliary muscle. We call this presbyopia. So it becomes harder and harder to read, and they need a longer arm. And the lens is less opaque. So the ability, you lose static and dynamic activity to look at somebody steady and also movement. So try and stand as still and face the individual. The pupil also less and less light, and so you need better lighting. And contrast sensitivity decreases so that the target and background discrimination declines. Next slide, please. And all this means that when you see your individual who's older, remember to identify yourself, provide adequate lighting, make sure the patient's glasses are on, look face to face so he can see you, minimize glare. And we see this, of course, in, especially in patients with diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, hypertension, lupus, and especially diseases like glaucoma, macular degeneration, cataracts, and diabetic retinopathy. Next slide, please. Hearing problems. I'm one to talk. My hearing is awful. Uh, with aging, there's an increase in dryness that can lead to cerumen impaction, a decrease in high-frequency hearing activity, and we call this presbycusis. Impaired speech recognition with background noise, so make sure it's quiet, not with a lot of noise in the room. It's very difficult for older people to hear you. And hearing loss itself can lead to social isolation. Speech discrimination also declines with aging. And localizing the source of sound becomes difficult. We use what we call the hearing handicap inventory for the elderly. And I'll be sending you a copy of this. Next slide, please. So what do we do? When we go in to see an older person, make sure that they can hear. If need be, the first thing you do is look for a cerumen impaction in the ear and clean it out. Always ensure that the individual is wearing their hearing aids with new batteries and face the individual so they can read your lips. And consider the use of a pocket talker if available, which is an electronic device with earphones that amplifies sound. Next slide, please. Another area that we always have to be concerned about to understand is that of cognitive impairment. We always take for granted, well, the individual can hear us and understand us, but not necessarily so. And that's up to us to determine whether that individual has the capacity to make decisions. So we also, number one, consider the presence of delirium, and we commonly use the CAM which will be in your packet. We check for cognitive deficits using a very brief mini-cog assessment, and I'll send you a copy of that. And that can be done five minutes or less, looking at recall, clock drawing. Also, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, called the MOCA, takes about six to 10 minutes to administer. Most common cause that we see of neurodegenerative dementia is Alzheimer's plus vascular as a neurodegenerative disease. And the DSM-5 lists 
problems with memory and learning, language, executive function, social cognition, perceptual motor function, and complex attention. So it's important that we familiarize ourselves with these and understand what it means in terms of assessing for cognitive impairment. Sec next slide, please. Another thing that we see besides memory and learning and the others I've listed are behavioral problems. You can see agitation, aggression, hallucinations, delusions, screaming, vocalizations, uncooperative, trying to get out of bed, increasing risk for falls. Next slide, please. How do we deal with these behavior issues? Uh, a lot of times we want to jump right in and give a medication but the first thing that we do is check for what we call unmet needs, such as urinary retention, impaction, pain, thirst, loneliness. And consider things like music therapy, aromatherapy, horticulture therapy, massage therapy. If those don't work, then we can consider medications. And they should be very carefully given to older people. We'll talk about that later. Remember that even though we commonly use it, in older people, benzodiazepines can lead to more agitation. So we have to be very careful with them if we want to use them at all. Antipsychotic medications are used. We would recommend second generation, such as quetiapine. When you use that first generation like Haldol, have to be very careful and monitor for what we call the extrapyramidal syndrome, consisting of dystonias, akathisias, and Parkinsonism, especially in the elderly individual, an older individual. Next slide, please. Also pain. I mean, when we talk about pain, we always have to consider non-physical causes such as fear, anxiety, grief, unmet spiritual needs. And these spiritual needs can re-emerge or emerge at the end of life when older adults have more time to reminisce about their life, what they did, what they should have done. And this can exacerbate the symptoms of pain. Always remember that. And we can see feelings of anger, hopelessness, feeling abandoned by God, questioning the meaning of life, depression, anxiousness, and difficulty sleeping. So always be aware of spiritual distress. Next slide, please. Next slide. Pain assessment. We do, and I'm sending you a copy. You'll have it called the pain ad scale, where we look at things like breathing, negative vocalization, facial expression, body language, consolability to assess for pain, rather than asking them what their pain level is by a score, an individual that doesn't have that cognitive ability isn't going to be able to tell you so we use this approach to determine if that individual is suffering from pain. And we can score it depending upon scoring of these. And you'll see that on the form that you'll be getting. Next slide, please. Another area that is a difficult one is caregiver burden. For individuals at home taken care of by caregivers, the strain can be perceived by the caregiver from caring for a family member or a loved one. And we see this. We see them change. We see them feeling blue, having loss of interest in activities, change in appetite, feeling sick. And under those circumstances, it can affect the care of that individual. So we have to be well aware of caregiver burden. Use things like improving their sleep, uh, having them get support, going to different meetings, learning about getting uh, 
approaches to improve their ability to deal with it. We even have respite where we can have somebody go there for a while to take care of their loved one so they can get that rest. But always beware, look at the caregiver and determine their burden. They can really suffer a lot and then it can affect the care of the individual with a problem on hospice themselves. Next slide, please. So we have almost five minutes left. Function. Another area that we have to look at is function. Activities of daily living. And I'm sending you the CAT scale and Brody scale so you understand function. Next slide, please. Also, I'm sending you the FAST scale, which gives you the functional assessment staging at the end of life in these individuals with dementia. Next slide. And it lists them, and it's able to use the FAST scale to help us determine prognosis. So that's in your packet. And it, it looks as dementia goes through different stages, starting where there's really no problem all the way to the end when an individual can't hold up their head. This is called the FAST scale, and we use this to determine levels of function that meet hospice criteria. And I'm sending you that also. Next slide, please. Falls. Be very aware of falls in individuals at the end of life, either at home or in a, in a facility and maintain a safe environment. Use fall mats, low bed, good lighting. Bed chairs and alarms have not been found to prevent falls, and they make people more anxious. And I send you some assessments for fall assessment in the elderly in your packet. Next slide, please. Polypharmacy, a major issue in older people. And remember, things like adverse effects of certain medication like anticholinergics or benzodiazepines or to antipsychotics. And remember drug-drug interaction with these metabolism like 3A4, 2D6 pathways. Also avoid giving one medication to treat the side effects of another and that's called a prescribing cascade. Always do medication reconciliation. Next slide, please. Social well-being at the end of life. People struggle at the end of life with loneliness and isolation. And be aware of that. I've listed this on these slides for you to read. But remember that loneliness and social isolation can be very, very destructful. And they can cause emotional, physical, and existential distress. Next slide. Moral injury. When an individual does something against their beliefs and refer to an act of commission, or they do something that is an act of omission, it can affect them many years later, as we see in the next slide. Later adult trauma re-engagement, and read this, because this can affect an older people as they have the normative changes of aging on top of their prior exposure to trauma, it can reoccur. Next slide, please. In conclusion, as you see, looking at a number of these other factors is very critical in the care of taking care of older people on hospice. And I gave you a lot of material and I'm sending a lot of uh, forms. And it's a lot, but it's very important to remember because understanding these intrinsic and extrinsic factors associated with the aging process can improve care of this group at the end of life, allowing a more peaceful death. Thank you so much. I know there's a lot of material here, but I wanna thank everyone for being here. Dayavad. Stay healthy and happy.
Hello everyone, I am Dr. Pankaj Singhi and here I will be talking about integration of palliative care in kidney diseases. So what is kidney palliative care? Kidney palliative care is a, a specialty of palliative care where we uh, uh, provide our expert symptom management, our caregiver empowerment and goals of care discussion uh, and planning with patients and their families to optimize patient's quality of life in patients with understage kidney diseases. So why is it important? It is important because these patients suffers with many symptoms and that may be very se severe uh, and it can be there for a long, long time. These patients also uh, have a lot of psychosocial distress and they a lot of um, majority of these patients suffer uh, high intensity of futile care at their end of life. So uh, in summary, they have high symptom burden and poor quality of uh, and death. So it is important that we uh, integrate palliative care into these patients. But the question comes how to integrate palliative care into these questions. Let us understand this with a patient's case story. So this is Mr. AZ, who is a 50 year old male. He had diabetes, hypertension for a few years, and then he was diagnosed with end stage kidney disease. He approached a nephrologist and who suggested that the patients will require a renal replacement therapy. Uh, so he chose a peritoneal dialysis and uh, for a few years. And once he got a, a donor, uh, he underwent a renal transplant. He did fairly well for around eight years, but then he developed a stroke and uh, he was um, bed bound for most of the time. Uh, this time, uh, he, his nephrologist has introduced uh, uh, a palliative care physician and, and he suggested for palliative care. Uh, so he chose uh, for, uh, for, for conservative care there and he survived for almost uh, uh, six months uh, uh, and he died after that. So here uh, uh, we want to discuss how, how palliative care approaches can be, uh, con can be done. So this is a chart of a patients in the life story of the patients, how when the patient came uh, with the diagnosis uh, of CKD, he was under evaluation, he had a lot of anxiety associated with that. So in that case, we feel these things uh, can be better dealt when uh, uh, we train nephrologists uh, into palliative care skills, like identifying the psychological distress or um, good symptom assessment at that point of time, identify the patient's goals at that point of time. So that's what uh, a good nephrologist with palliative care skills will do. He will address the goals of uh, uh, care in these patients. So here, uh, Mr. AZ, he uh, chose that he wants to live. He wants to complete his um, uh, uh, unmet, uh, uh, what he wanted to do. Uh, also, he said he wanted to um, be independent as much as possible, and he wants to stay comfortable. So those values were documented. And then the next goal comes when the patient is on dialysis or on renal transplant, the patient's uh, symptoms need to be adequately controlled. So primarily basic symptoms, uh, nephrologist can easily manage. Dot, uh, uh, like in this patient, he was having restless leg syndrome. So uh, nephrologist can correct uh, iron uh, labels or iron deficiency anemia in these patients and uh, give primary medications for restless leg syndrome. But uh, as he developed those refractory symptoms, uh, the nephrologist referred him to a palliative care physician who is expert in symptom management. So that uh, a symptom was uh, a trigger for a palliative care uh, uh, integration in, in this patient. And uh, that's how the patients knew about a palliative care services. A few years later, uh, when he developed a stroke, at that time, uh, again, the nephrologist had suggested a palliative care uh, visit, palliative care team visit. 
So where uh, uh, the palliative care team, uh, along with nephrologist, discussed about the goals uh, again, that should we change some goal when there's a renal failure setting in, he's developing recurrent infections, he has a stroke, he's not able to move. So there a family meeting uh, was done and uh, what uh, uh, the patient and uh, their family members felt like they need to focus more on his comfort rather than the longevity. So what decision uh, everyone took that he doesn't want to continue maintenance dialysis at that point of time, but he wants to stay comfortable. That includes that if needed, he would undergo dialysis also when there is a lot of fluid buildup or breathlessness. He would undergo uh, dialysis also. He wanted to stay as independent as possible. Um, uh, so oh, whether possible, he himself can uh, undergo uh, the dialysis, peritoneal dialysis at home only. And uh, as I said, like he wanted to continue dialysis primarily as a comfort measure, but also if it can provide some longevity of the life. But uh, over the time, uh, it was felt that his uh, situation was deteriorating and the palliative care team uh, prepared the uh, patient and the family members for end of life care. And the patient was considered for uh, a home uh, care or hospice care where uh, you know, conservative kidney care was provided where the uh, patient uh, was not on dialysis, but uh, uh, it, uh, it was mainly for his symptom control. Patient died uh, uh, after a few months and uh, the continuity of care was given as a bereavement support to the family members. So that is a model uh, that can be a successful model of palliative care. As we know that there is a large a number of population with CKD and it would be practically impossible to provide uh, palliative care to each and uh, every uh, dialysis uh, patients or end stage kidney diseases. So that's why it is important that we teach palliative care skills into nephrologists where they can openly communicate about the goals, about the distress symptoms, they manage the primary symptoms and they should know when to refer that patient. So that's why there are some uh, validated models that were published in uh, various articles. So one model is scaling palliative care. Scaling palliative care means that, uh, 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 that we train a nephrologist uh, into basic palliative care. Uh, those nephrologists will teach other uh, uh, colleagues or other nephrologists about palliative care skills. So there was a successful uh, and very famous nephro talk uh, model uh, uh, where the uh, nephrologist used to teach kidney palliative care. Uh, then comes the embedded uh, kidney palliative care model where uh, the palliative care team would be there along with the nephrology team within the uh, uh, facilities of dialysis or uh, 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 kidney OPDs and all, and they will provide a expert palliative care or specialized palliative care. Third, the home care services can, or mobile uh, uh, palliative care units can provide uh, care near their uh, home or um, uh, to their uh, native places, their um, areas. And other important model that need to be integrated, especially in uh, like in our country where most of uh, the health support is given through the government. So government, what it can do, it, they can initiate kidney palliative care uh, programs in top uh, uh, academic institutes. And also they can uh, recognize the pathways, the guidelines to include kidney palliative care at each level, at uh, from uh, primary health center to uh, not tertiary or topmost academic centers. So these are the a few models how palliative care can be integrated in these patients. There is uh, are many roadblocks, many challenges in to providing these things. What are major uh, roadblocks? Are uh, first thing most of nephrologists are not aware about palliative care because they were never trained into that. Similarly, even in palliative care, uh, uh, people there are hardly very superficial training about uh, renal palliative care and they need to be trained better into 
uh, uh, providing renal palliative care. I mean to say each specialist palliative care should know about renal palliative care. There is a lot of stigma about palliative care. Most of uh, physicians feel it is only end of life care or they feel like uh, those opioids or painkillers may be um, very challenging or um, may be harmful for the patients. Many a times they uh, feel uh, these palliative care uh, physicians and doesn't have expertise to provide palliative care in, for nephrology patients, those drug doses and all. Uh, it, uh, 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 they don't have expertise. As I said, the awareness uh, uh, is lacking among nephrologists and also among the patients and their family members. Uh, the concept of advanced care planning, concept of conservative kidney um, care, these things need the, uh, the nephrologist and patients and family need to be aware of. There are a lot of fears of legal complications like withdrawal from dialysis, uh, 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 withholding of uh, futile uh, attempts uh, at the end of life and all. So uh, that can be our roadblocks. But what we can do for this? So here in Manipal, we tried to develop a model of renal palliative care. So we started with a master class where an international faculty uh, had trained 10 topmost nephrologists from all over India, along with 10 uh, palliative care physicians. And they came up with a guideline. So we divided them into six groups. Each group worked on particular topic of renal palliative care, and each one of them came out with a, uh, uh, with a uh, paper. So they studied that thing and they published a paper according to Indian scenario. So you can read this uh, article on uh, IJPC uh, website. It is freely uh, available, free access available as a supplement. Also, what we did, we started a dedicated kidney supportive care clinic within the dialysis room so that patients may be more aware about uh, these concepts and uh, nephrologist teams find it easy to refer a patient for this. Other than that, we also started many joint research projects, including nephrologists, dialysis team, psychologists, and palliative care physicians to uh, bring more evidence on this. We started elective uh, postings uh, around two weeks for residents who are doing DM program or MD in uh, medicine. Also for uh, uh, MSc students, some elective uh, modules were there. Uh, also, our team uh, had started, uh, had written a dedicated chapter on conservative kidney care in, in textbook of medicine, and that helps them, helps the physician to give a, uh, a, a option of kidney care without dialysis also. So this, uh, apart from that, there was a dedicated session on palliative care in kidney diseases. Uh, in National Conference of uh, uh, Nephrologists uh, uh, two years back. So these were major developments that happened since last two, three years. And I am very thankful for Dr. Frank Brennan and Dr. Uh, uh, Nandini Valla, Dr. Naveen Salins for supporting this idea in, in our country. So what, what we need to do ahead? So we need to include the, uh, this option of renal supportive care into the curriculum of nephrologists uh, in uh, academic institutes, their MD and DM programs. Also uh, the BSC uh, or the dialysis nurses, dialysis technician people need to be aware of. We need to make it as a core competency, which will be checked at the time of examinations in patients, uh, in, in uh, students who are undergoing nephrology training or also uh, those who are undergoing MD in palliative care. Uh, we need to establish such renal supportive care units in all major institutes, and that will be uh, reflected in other uh, labels also. We need to grow uh, renal supportive care societies and that can advocate uh, 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 on this topic of renal supportive care and such workshop can be started. So as I said, this you can uh, read on the article. So this was about uh, uh, the model of renal palliative care uh, and uh, 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 that we can provide.
if you have any questions, you can mail us. Um, thank you so much for the patience listening. Thank you. Hello, good morning, everyone. Welcome to another session of integration of palliative care in non-oncology settings. Here we will be discussing how to integrate palliative care in cardiac conditions. So the overview of the session is we'll try and discuss how big the problem is uh, in cardiac conditions and what is the evidence of integration of palliative care with cardiac conditions. And we'll discuss some of the practical aspects of what can be done. So heart failure due to lots of cardiac conditions is very common in India. And there's a prevalence varies from 1.3 to 23 million according to literature. What we know about heart failure is that survival rates are worse than breast and prostate cancer, which usually most people are not aware of, including patients. And half the patients diagnosed with heart failure usually die within five years of their first hospital admission. And between one third to one half of patients die suddenly. So sudden cardiac death is also very common. That This is irrespective of the heart failure stage. So it's important for us to uh, have discussions, including advanced care planning for such patients due to this higher potential of sudden cardiac death. We can classify the heart failure according to two classifications. We can use both the New York Heart Association classification as well as the American College of Cardiology or American Heart Association. Now the ACA classification uh, deals with the, uh, the structural changes in the heart. So it goes from a stage A to stage D. Stage A is where there is presence of heart failure risk factors, but there's no heart disease or no symptoms. And that doesn't have an equivalent to an NHV classification. So when we come to stage B of ACC classification, the heart disease is present, but there are no symptoms, which is actually equivalent to a class one of NYHA, that means there is no limitation of physical activity. And when we come to class four of NYHA, which is unable to carry out any physical activity without discomfort, is equivalent to an advanced heart disease with continued heart failure symptoms, which requires, requires aggressive medical therapy. Now, what are the problems uh, uh, card cardiac failure patients can face? So what we know about them is that they do have debilitating physical and emotional symptoms. They can have loss of independence, disruption of social roles. And this, all these can actually decrease the quality of life. And sometimes the physical symptoms and advanced heart feel like pain uh, and other highly distressing symptoms um, are under-recognized and they are under-treated. Now, these patients are also involved in making complex decisions, uh, including complex treatments like cardiac devices, transplantation, and they have to do all these without adequate prognosis communication, and they need lots of support in this decision making. And also a patient with heart failure will be on numerous medications, uh, they could be on devices, and all these can pose a lot of financial and resource stress on families. And all these can impact on the quality of life of the patients we applied. Now, this paper was published as early in 2006 by Soleno et al., where they uh, did a systematic literature review, uh, including all the databases, and they were trying to find the common symptoms among end-stage patients with cancer as compared to all the non-oncology non conditions. So conditions like AIDS, heart disease, uh, COPD, and renal disease. And they went through uh, around 64 original studies um, and they found a list of 11 common symptoms. And what we can see now is that um, we know that uh, patients with end stage uh, or cancer do have a lot of symptoms, but similarly, the non-cardiac conditions also have a lot of symptoms. And here we'll be concentrating on the symptoms among of patients with heart failure. So we can see that they, they can potentially have more dyspnea than cancer patients. Uh, pain is also common, about 40 to 77. They're very, very they're fatigue, 69 to 82 percentage. Uh, depression is common, 9 to 36%, anxiety in 49%, and anorexia in 20 to 41%. 
Now, this, this study was published in 2002 in BMG, where they tried to uh, find out the quality of life of patients with congestive heart failure in using the same classes that I discussed earlier. And they compared uh, the quality of life with normal population. So this, uh, this was a German study, a German version of the SF36 uh, scale was used, which had eight dimensions, and it was administered to 205 patients with con congestive cardiac failure, and uh, it was compared with the normal population. So what you can see is that, uh, as expected, the quality of life of um, patients with heart failure was uh, was limited uh, compared to was significantly decreased compared to the normal population. The the, the graph on the top uh, gives the uh, is, is a quality of life of normal population, and it, we have given the uh, quality of life of NYHA one, two, and three. And what is interesting is that even the quality of life of um, patients with NYHA one who probably doesn't have much symptoms symptoms are still less than the normal population. Now, this was a qualitative study which was done um, among uh, carers looking after patients uh, with lung cancer and uh, cardiac failure in the community. So this was interviews was done every three months up to one year with the patients, the carers and key professional care carers. And they also included the uh, multidisciplinary focus group also. So 20 patients with inoperable lung cancer and 20 patients with advanced cardiac failure and their main carers and professional carers were interviewed in this study. And what they found was, and patients with cardiac failure, they had a different illness trajectory, uh, which is different uh, from the more linear and predictable course of patients with lung cancer. And um, they, the patients with cardiac failure also had a different um, difference in their information needs. And uh, they had a poorer understanding about the condition and, uh, and prognosis, and they were less involved in their decision making. Uh, and the prime concern of patients with lung cancer and the carers was facing death. For cardiac failure patients, the health, social and palliative care services were less readily available. So what they concluded was that the care should be proactive and designed to meet the specific needs of the patients. So we know that uh, there is a need uh, for the cardiac failure patient. So what is the evidence uh, we, we have right now uh, in integration of palliative care with uh, cardiology settings? Now, this was a systematic review and narrative synthesis uh, on the effect of multidisciplinary palliative care team in patients with symptomatic heart failure. And uh, they went through all the evidence uh, that was published till 2019. And they had about uh, 13 interventional and 10 observational studies with a total patient of 19,891. And uh, what they found was that, um, so all these studies reported uh, a multidisciplinary team involvement in heart failure patients. So, uh, they target Uh, the, the, the studies marked in green were showing um, significantly in favor of intervention. So you can see that, uh, you know, the symptoms, uh, depression, quality of life are all better with the inter intervention arm. And the, uh, so the mortality was in two studies reported that there was significantly fewer death in the intervention arm. Uh, and uh, in one of the studies of so the second study mentioned that the participants survived significantly. Arm. And that this was only in two studies. One was that there was eight articles from both the inpatient and outpatient settings from five countries, uh, two randomized control trials, and one observational study which assessed the advanced care planning as a part of specialist palliative care intervention. Two RCDs and three observational studies assessed ACP as a single component. And it was found that the ACPs reduced hospitalization, increased the referral to palliative care services, and supported the patient preferred place of death. So uh, what they concluded was that the best quality evidence supported advanced care planning as part of SPC for reducing hospitalization and early studies of APC integrated are promising.
So what can we do uh, to help these patients and how can we plan the services? Now, this is the trajectory that I think most of us are familiar with, how the heart, a patient with heart failure will progress along the life. So what we can see is that early in the heart failure, as patient goes on having diuresis and other evidence-based therapies, they go into a plateau of improved function. And uh, even when this uh, plateau is achieved, patients can benefit. So it's, it's better to integrate palliative care earlier on so that they can ha have help with the management of the symptoms uh, as also and also to cope with the diagnosis and, and the impact on their lives. Now, in between, they can have procedures like uh, heart transplantation or uh, devices can be applied. And that can happen at any, any, any point of their trajectory. So you can see that after uh, plateau, they can have dips and they come back normal. And they dwindle and then they finally reach the phase five or end. And this is one of the models that has been proposed that is integrating palliative care across the heart failure experience right from the diagnosis. So initiate the palliative care at tantum. So the conventional or traditional heart failure management uh, include patient assessments, uh, medical and family histories, physical examination, diagnostic tests, and all the patient reported outcomes. And also to communicate, uh, predict and communicate prognosis, choose the therapy, manage the trigger events. At the same time, the pain and symptoms can be managed by, uh, by the principles of primary palliative care. They can assist with the medical decision making, advanced care planning, uh, reduce emotional distress in the family, and cognition of care across the patient stream and promote the quality of life. And uh, the specialist palliative care can be considered for symptoms like uh, intractable symptoms or um, discussions regarding. Now, the important thing to remember is that the, the, referent, uh, the referral to palliative care services should be a needs-based care and not based on prognosis. So a patient should have a regular systematic and regular holistic assessment and to identify and triage the need of the patient and carer. So is there a tool that we can, use, can be used? And we've got a tool called Needs Assessment Tool, Progressive Disease Heart Failure, that is NAT PDHF tool. This was uh, developed and validated in 2013 in use of this tool. And this tool can be used both by in specialist palliative care setting as well as in the cardiology setting. So what, what does the needs assessment tool involve? The NAT-PD tool, uh, this is specifically for heart failure, include uh, about three sections. In the first section, uh, you have to, uh, to go to the patient's needs and to find whether there's any priority referral needed for further assessment, including um, the patient doesn't have a caregiver or the patient has requested for a specialist palliative care services uh, or uh, if the patient needs, uh, the caregiver needs an assistance in managing the care of the patient and the family. Now, the second one is about the patient well-being, where the questions are asked about the patient's symptoms, including physical symptoms, um, ADLs, uh, psychological symptoms, concerns about the medications and treatment, concerns about spiritual and existential issues, uh, financial and legal concerns, um, and um, any cultural or social factors. And does the patient need further information regarding any services? And the third aspect is about the caregiver's needs. So uh, the about caregiver, is, it's a family of the caregiver, distress about the patient. Uh, are they having a difficulty in providing care and have they have difficulty in managing the patient's medication or financial legal concerns? And the fourth session is about the caregiver well-being. Again, um, uh, you know, about the caregiver being Uh, our cardiologists might need uh, training in advanced communication skills in symptom assessment and symptom management. Uh, they might need help with recognition of the psychological needs, also advanced care planning. The important thing to remember is that when we have discussions about do not resuscitate or do not provide CPR for the patient, it does not mean that it's not treat. So um, it only means that you start the heart once it stops. So we need to have discussions regarding DNA CPR with the uh, treating physicians. Uh, it does not mean that the patient is dying quicker. So it's important for us to have this communication with the cardiologist in the hospital. And similarly, the palliative care physicians will need more training on diuretic management, the pharmacological management of heart failure and the use of devices. So uh, basically, the training has to be a two-way process where we give our skills um, to the um, treating specialist and, and we learn from them to manage uh, the patients accordingly. 
cardiac medications. It's important for us to know a bit about the cardiac medications. And these are useful for survival of the patients. It will also reduce hospital admissions and we know that the patients need to be maintained on them at a maximum tolerated dose. And sometimes we need to stop them or reduce them during acute episodes, especially during uh, sepsis or acute heart failure. And, and at the end stage, sometimes the medication may have to temporarily stop them to enable the diuret to work properly during decompensation episodes. So other medications may have to be stopped during the end stage. But these are the medications that I mentioned. All these uh, cardiac drugs are started according to the uh, to the um, uh, the class of the heart failure. So we can see that in NYHA class one, we don't give them diuretics because they don't have any symptoms of um, fluid overload. The diuretics started in, in from class two and it's continued to class four, and it actually decreases hospital admissions and improves the functional status. You can also support patients at home, so especially with the use of subcutaneous flusamide for injection. So patients who, who uh, do not otherwise need to be admitted to hospital and they wish to be supported at home can be managed with subcut flusamide. And this is an uh, option when there's very, very poor venous access in the patient. And this has been tried in the UK and has been... Uh, The IV versus subcut, 16 part participants of New York NYHA class 2 were given a single infusion of uh, 80 mg IV frusamide um, or subcut frusamide over 5 hours. So the IV was tired dose and subcut was over 5 hours and you can see that the subcut frusamide used a biphasic delivery profile resulted in the therapeutic levels within 30 minutes and that was maintained um, for the entire drug administration uh, for 5 hours. And uh, you can see that the bolus, bolus was there and then it came down immediately. And there was a similar urine output and nature to come back to IV and subcut also. Uh, the erythema and edema at uh, the site was monitored and this was minimal. One per patient had transient very slight erythema during the subcut administration and uh, eight patients had very slight edema after completion. So it's usually well tolerated with minimal erythema and edema at the site of injection. And this was the uh, service development improvement project which supported in BMJ about use of subcut uh, frusamide in advanced heart failure in, in Palita. And this was administered by the heart failure specialist nurse, MDT and hospice staff. Uh, they cover around 116 people with a mean age of 79 and NYHA class three and four received 130 episodes of uh, subcut frusamide. And uh, uh, average duration for 10 days, one to 49 days. And um, uh, half the hours in patients own home or care home. This will prevent the hospital administration. The average daily dose of rosemite given was 125 milligram. And the goal of treatment was achieved in 91 percentage of cases with a reduction rate of 4 kg. And the blood process was reduced from 8.2 to 5. So we have now seen that uh, problems, the, the non cardiac, the cardiac patients do have problems, but that is special palliative care input. We have evidence to see that palliative care uh, improves the quality of life of um, patients with heart, heart failure. And we know that what can be done. Good morning, friends. I'm Savita Dumai, and I will be taking a session on the early integration of palliative care in 80 million people living with HIV in India, of which about 57,000 are those with new infections. There's been quite a big change in the presentation of HIV since it was first noticed in the 1980s. The single most factor responsible for this change is heart, highly active antiretroviral, which is treatment that suppresses the virus from replicating, improves the host immunity, and slows down the progression of the infection. Heart was introduced in 1996, and since then it's been evolving and improving. 
It has changed HIV from being a rapidly progressive fatal illness in the pre-heart era to now being a chronic disease with a increased life expectancy. So then the question is that if HIV is no longer a predominantly terminal illness, then is palliative care really needed for people with HIV? And if it is needed, then at what stage should it be introduced? According to WHO, palliative care should be incorporated as appropriate at every stage of HIV disease. UNAID says that all people living with HIV should be provided with effective palliative care throughout their treatment course. So from these statements, we can conclude that people with HIV have palliative care needs throughout the course of their illness. Treatment services, that is ART and palliative care should go hand in hand and palliative care should be integrated early that is from the time of diagnosis of HIV. What difference does early integration of palliative care really make? Imagine a scenario where someone with HIV is diagnosed or where someone is diagnosed to have HIV and only ART is started for this person. There's a likelihood that adherence will be poor, especially in certain groups, in which case HIV will progress fast, leading to death. But even if adherence is fine, there's a high chance that this person will have a poor quality of life. So that's where palliative care comes in. If palliative care is started and given along with ART for this person, and there will be a significant improvement in the outcomes. Not only will adherence improve, but also quality of life. We need to know the factors that can cause poor adherence and poor quality of life. First are the barriers to access to ART. Even though ART is free of cost, there are many other difficulties and challenges that people face to access this ART. Where I practice is hilly terrain. So a person with HIV from these parts to get ART has to travel more than three hours to the district hospital on bad, bumpy roads. There's risky travel. There's no public transport. The money, the time, the effort that is involved is so much. Side effects of ERT, nausea and vomiting, fatigue, weakness, sleeplessness, insomnia. Internal stigma the internalized feelings of shame, of a loss of self-worth, a belief that one is cursed. People with HIV are generally physically weak. They can have chronic symptoms like pain. They're prone to infections. They have comorbidities. Because of all of this, they have a frequent need for medical care that drains their finances. They find it difficult to hold a job. Mental health issues are huge. Depression, anxiety, suicidal tendencies are so much more common in people with HIV. A person with depression has the will to live. ART may be available free of cost. But if the desire to live is not there, then what will drive him or her to take that ART? 
substance abuse, tobacco, alcohol, drugs, all just add to that vicious cycle. Entire families are affected. The primary caregiver can also probably have HIV. She will be physically weak and vulnerable. Children, their education, their development is compromised. They face trauma on multiple fronts and can be scarred for life. They can get into addictions, risky behavior, criminal activity. There can be conflicts within the family, between husband and wife, between parents and children, extended family. It could be domestic violence. So much is happening below the surface. And just giving ART is not enough. So what makes a palliative care approach effective? The answer lies in the very ethos of palliative care. It is person-centered. It lies in the way we see someone with HIV. We see him or her as a person, not as a disease. A person with dignity with immeasurable value. It influences the way we care for that person, the attitudes we have towards them. We want to preserve that dignity. We want to address factors that strip them of their dignity. We want to know them as persons, we listen to them, empathize with their feelings, will caring relationships. We want to understand from their perspective, not just our perspective. So we don't glibly just say, the patient refused treatment. No, we try to understand what were the factors that made it difficult for this person to continue treatment. And then we try to address those factors. The goals of palliative care are powerful. Relieve suffering, improve quality of life. We know and pain is not just physical. We recognize different sources of pain. We do rigorous assessment of every kind of pain. And we come together as a, as a team to provide whole person care for that unique person. We do good symptom management, but we also support, we encourage, we listen, we counsel, we resolve conflicts. We help improve income, we give food hampers, and so much more. We walk the journey with them. Palliative care is family-centered care. We believe in supporting families and empowering them in every way possible, which is so important for HIV care. No wonder WHO says, Palliative care should be incorporated at every stage of HIV. A quick look at the symptoms commonly experienced. Even if a person is on ART, there's a chance that he will still experience some of these symptoms. There could be a variety of reasons. It could be the virus itself that's causing it. It could be ART side effects opportunistic infections, comorbidities, psychosocial factors. Some of the common symptoms, first pain. A study in South Africa found that about 50 to 70 percent of people with HIV were living with pain and in a majority it was moderate to severe. And most of this pain was under treated or not treated. Cough and dyspnea because there's more Pneumonia, TB, COPD, this fatigue, depression, anxiety, insomnia. As palliative care practitioners, we should pick up these symptoms and manage them well. People with HIV have some comorbidities that are more common and prevalent among them. I'll run through the list. 
cardiovascular, there's more atherosclerosis, congestive heart failure, pulmonary, there's more TB, COPD. Co-infections of HIV and hepatitis C are quite common, and if this happens, it progresses faster to end-stage liver disease. There can be drug-induced nephrotoxicity, renal failure, bones, they can get affected, there can be osteoporosis with fractures, osteonecrosis, neurocognitive disorders, psychiatric disorders, there's premature aging and frailty, and quite a few different types of malignancies, both AIDS-defining and non-AIDS-defining. Unlike the pre-heart era where people with HIV uh, there was a high mortality because of advanced disease or severe opportunistic infections. In the heart era, morbidity and mortality in HIV is largely due to these comorbidities. Several of them can progress over time and become advanced and go into the end stage, end stage organ failures, end stage cancer. That is why early intervention in palliative care is so important to support patients and families through these comorbidities to manage the symptoms. And as the patient if he or she progresses the illness in these comorbidities, then palliative care can facilitate advanced care planning so that end of life outcomes are better. I'd like to emphasize again the importance of psychosocial spiritual care in HIV care. This cannot be ignored, it cannot be minimized. A few words on ART. Palliative care is not a substitute for ART, it is an adjunct to ART. So as palliative care practitioners, we should take every effort to help people with HIV start the ART and to maintain and take ART regularly. Earlier, the recommendation was that ART was started if patient CD4 was less than 500. But now the recommendation is that all patients with HIV, irrespective of their CD4, should be started on ART. It's available free of cost at government ART centers. And the current ART regimen is TLD, Tinofovir, Lamivudine, and Dolutegravir. This change came about in 2020. Earlier it was TLE, Tinofovir, Lamivudine, Efavirenz. The, drug, the new drug, Dolutegravir, was introduced because it was found, research found that uh, it helps suppress viral replication better there's less resistance and fewer side effects. CD4 counts are to be monitored regularly. CD4 is an indicator of how well and how effective the treatment is, and it is monitored every six months. And finally, I'd like to quote Dame Cicely Saunders. You matter because you are. Can we say that to every person with HIV whom we care for? You matter because you are. And because you matter, I want to take, I want to take every effort, I want to do everything I can to support you and enable you to live life to the fullest. You matter because you are. Thank you. Good morning all. Uh, I'm Dr. Vivek from CIPLA Palliative Care and Training Center. So greetings from CIPLA Palliative Care and Training Center and happy to be the part of IPCON 2022. So in today's sessions, we are all discussing on early integration of palliative care in non-cancer setting. 
the speakers before me have highlighted the integ integration aspect in different settings like renal, cardiac, and HIV, etc. So they have set the context of early integration. So we all uh, we are all witnessing the uh, change in the trends of the diseases. So non-communicable diseases are on the rise, and luckily due to the various awareness programs and national uh, programs on the NCD. So we have seen the significant improvement in the preventive actions and the programs. We also have seen that disease directed treatments are uh, available at various uh, government hospitals and the private hospitals, which has made a good impact on the management of the NCDs. But when we see the uh, change in the trends of the diseases from infective communicable diseases to non-communicable diseases are rising. We are also seeing the changes uh, in the focus of the treatment. Initially, we were focusing majorly on the disease-directed treatment, the curative aspect of it and the preventive aspect. But now there is uh, overall recognition that the quality of life of the patients and the family members of those patients who are suffering from life-limiting illnesses, non-communicable diseases, that quality of life has to be highlighted and uh, it has to be improved. So uh, the National Health Policy in 2017 acknowledged the rising trends of non-communicable diseases. At the same time, they have recognized the role of palliative care services in enhancing the quality of life. Similarly, the WHO recommends improving access to palliative care as a core component of the healthcare system. And they see that the basic healthcare system, the grassroots level, the palliative care should be incorporated. National Program for Prevention and Control of Cancer, Diabetes, and Cardiovascular Disease and Stroke, NPCDS, has recommended the inclusion of palliative care services into the uh, healthcare programs and the care plans of the uh, patients. So, with this focus in the uh, uh, from curative diseases, more from curative to the enhancing the quality of life of patients, there is a need of palliative care. Now, the palliative care has a broad spectrum, starting from the supportive care in the early stages to the palliative care and the end of life care. So, from the start to the end, this patient, uh, the interventions are directed towards improving the quality of life of patients. So, considering this we need to see that palliative care is available to all the needy patients. But the need for the palliative care are uh, largely unmet. But we do not have a data, the robust data on the palliative, uh, unmet needs for the palliative care in India is lacking. And for that, uh, it is very necessary that we should take up initiative to quantify what are the unmet needs of the uh, patients in, in terms of palliative care in Indian setup. So evidences are needed and we have to see the <coughs> feasibility of converging palliative care within the current public health system as well. So on this background, so in 2017, the Lancet Commission came with a report which defined the serious health suffering. Now the serious health suffering, they are not focusing majorly on the diagnosis like cancer or non-cancer, but they are focusing majorly the symptom wise. So they have enlisted some 15 symptoms where this uh, serious health related suffering has been highlighted. So these 19 symptoms are very commonly seen in the patients with life limit, uh, limiting illnesses, non-communicable diseases like cancer, HIV and other diseases as well. So to uh, quantify the unmet needs of the patient and to address those needs of the patient, we need to do the interventions. Now, as we see the palliative care services in India, it is there are so many policies are available in various states. Some states have implemented at a very PSC level and they are doing quite well. But many states has policies, but not completely implement, uh, properly implemented at grassroots level. And they are primarily focusing on the training aspect of the healthcare workers. So there is a missing link between uh, when the healthcare professionals are trained now that skills which we are giving to the healthcare professional, whether it has been utilized to identify those patients and the services are provided where they need it. So that link is missing. And to address to the net, when we see that developing more centers on the palliative care may not be physical as it's a financially very uh, burdening and not that many healthcare palliative care professionals are available. 
so what we have to do is that we have to use the public se sector the current existing government health system along with palliative care organization and the other organization the community based organizations who are working in the uh, health area at ground level they have to come up together and come uh, do the intervention at grassroots level where the palliative care will be provided so we came up across that national health mission the state government uh, functionaries uh, we have contacted them and along with the aga khan health services we designed one program where the whole aim was to use the frontline workers the frontline healthcare workers at the ground level as a agents of change now how the this will function as a agents of change that we have to train them in the how uh, basics of palliative care and identifying the patients who needs palliative care at grassroots level okay so once they are trained so when they are doing the home visits and you know uh, the field visits they will identify the patients who are needing and this will be referred to the primary health centers and from there it may be referred to the tertiary level uh, government hospitals for non cancer patients symptom management and to the sipla palliative care center for the cancer uh, related symptom management so this front level healthcare workers will become the most important for, uh, link in identifying and referring the patient to the primary health centers and the healthcare professionals to manage the symptoms okay so again so when we see this patients identified referred now the another aspect is we have to follow up these patients as well so after they take an initial uh, intervention identify and referred taken a treatment at either at psc level or rural hospital level or they have referred to the tertiary level care for the symptom management after that when the patient comes back home whether they are symptomatically stable or they have a added some support they need extra support or something like that so that with the community based organizations will help us to keep the follow up along with the asha workers to uh, track such patients and also check the awareness of the community before and after intervention so uh, when they have been identified and referred after that how much the they understand the palliative care how much they understand that palliative care will help them to manage their symptoms so that awareness is also we need to check okay so with the help of aga khan uh, health services and uh, nhm and the state government health functionaries so sipla palliative care training uh, center has come up with the project where we have selected two rural blocks of the pune district and this block selection was done in consultation with public health department of government of maharashtra so where we have trained the medical officers in palliative care and also trained the serious health suffering and those 19 symptoms uh, in this 19 uh, which are the 19 symptoms are there what is the basic management of those symptoms at the psc level so these master trainers will train the asha workers anms mpws and cho at the grassroots level so when they do the visits they will do uh, identify patient based on the checklist so this manual for the asha workers was prepared in the local language which was adapted from the previous module which government of maharashtra has prepared earlier so after the conduction uh, uh, doing the induction training for two days uh, so this training continued for the asha workers anm mpws and cho for six months and then there was a refresher training was organized on a regular intervals so we have trained somewhere around 285 asha workers on the field and at the same time 37 uh, medical officers as well so this is a checklist of symptoms with the uh, lancet commission report highlighted as the 19 symptoms uh, are there where uh, which are the major cause of the suffering in the patients and they are silently suffering at home and needs to be uh, addressed so these two blocks are little bit away from the pune city and as these are the rural hospital it has somewhere 11 phcs and uh, roughly around 60 65 sub centers they were having next please yeah so what are the interventions there as i have earlier said that asha workers were the main focus of this program because we need to identify the patients and once the patients are identified these patients will be referred back to the primary health center who are trained in the basic palliative care management 
and then there is a referral system for tertiary palliative care uh, even for the cancer at cpc and non cancer at other government hospital as well so identification and referral system is the most important so along with this we have conducted the camps at the psc level when the patients are not able to be uh, travel to the tertiary level hospital or the cpc for symptom management so we have conducted monthly camps over there so have seen many patients and delivered the medicine there itself so through this asha workers identified somewhere around 1482 patients of which 432 were cancer and majority patients were the non cancer uh, who has those symptoms out of the 19 serious health suffering symptom list okay after this there was a regular uh, review meetings were conducted with asha workers and the frontline other workers to identify uh, address their challenges they face and their experiences and any uh, the additional support they require to continue this intervention Next. the major achievements as i earlier mentioned that out of which uh, 1482 patients which we identified 432 were cancers and 1050 were non cancer 100 and, uh, 1179 patients who were referred to government health center for further management of which 542 uh, did referred to the tertiary government hospital for uh, advanced symptom management who were non cancer patient and 100 patients were referred to cpc which were cancer patients and they needed admission for end of life care next so while running this uh, program where we have used the community based organization and existing healthcare system and we as a palliative care expert organization so we also face certain challenges while delivering the care at uh, ground level and the most first and the most important was the availability of medicines so many uh, basic pain many medications were not available at uh, psc level so they have to refer to the rural hospital the morphine was not much available at rural hospital district level hospital there morphine was available but there was no the uh, the professional healthcare professional who were willing to use the morphine for pain management at district level because of lack of training okay next was the limitation of care issue so certain cases were difficult to manage at home like terminally care patient because resources were less available and managing those terminally ill patients the healthcare professionals availability was less and their training work was also less on that second was the access issue those terminally ill patient who need admission for advanced symptom management Uh, as they are living in a very remote area so transportation to the tertiary level center or the palliative care center was difficult task next please so considering our achievements and the challenges what we face there are certain learning so as this is the one of the first uh, public private partnership uh, intervention study in palliative care in maharashtra so we have to say that how we can take up because we have selected only two blocks and did in two Uh, years period we have done this intervention and after that the covid started so we could not extend to the other things because the major focus was on the covid but this is a new challenge that you know how we will uh, extend this project into the other blocks of the pune district and we also have to see how the government schemes where the government is talking over 60% 40% uh, uh, public private partnership uh, model so that also we have to think about it the conducting the tele consultation now covid has taught us a lot of things uh, how to use uh, tele consultation for uh, delivering the services to the patient so what we do here is those patients who are not able to travel to the palliative care but they need advanced pain management we are managing with the help of medical officers or the ground level workers uh, through the media of tele consultations and the medications who they require and which is not available at at the grassroots level with the help of other organization we have made a tie up with the pharmacy in the local areas so they can deliver the medicines to these patients so assessment at the community level using the lancet commission report now this report has highlighted serious health suffering and this is very easier for us to identify patient who needs palliative care it may be the small form of symptom management it may be the counseling Uh, of where the patient should be taken for where the palliative services are available but this was a very uh, unique case that this 
the report was used to uh, deliver the care at community level. Next, please. And the role of ASHA was highlighted. As ASHA has been very instrumental in various healthcare programs. But ASHA workers, when they train, they are highly motivated to do this uh, identifying the patients and referring back to them. But we do not want to overburden the ASHA workers with that thing. And that's why the incentive scheme for identifying and referring these patients to the uh, healthcare system so that they will not suffer at home. So that system has to be highlighted. So this is a small intervention that CPC has done uh, at the community level with the help of existing frontline health worker, government machinery, and uh, the community-based organization. And in two blocks, it has been quite useful and we need to replicate similar model in other blocks as well. So thank you very much for patient listening. And if any question, I would be happy to take. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all speakers. Sorry. Thank you to all the speakers for their wonderful presentations. And uh, now we have a question for Dr. Silverman. Dr. Michael Silverman, thank you so much for being a part of our conference. And uh, we have a short question for you. Uh, so just a uh, small bit of uh, time we have left before the next session. So we just want to ask you, how do you do the geriatric care in the veterans program there? It's, it's not coming in clear. Uh, could you uh, text that to me? What's the question? So I'm asking, how do you do the veterans program for geriatrics? The residence program, right? Yes, sir. How do you do the program? Well, <clears throat> for the for the medical residents. Uh, well, the idea is that basically, uh, with when it comes to palliative care, to realize that when you take care of older people on hospice, that you have to look at the whole patient. You know, we're we're talking tonight. We focus on different areas, but the key thing to me is that you look at the whole patient, and then you address all of that at the same time you're dealing with a palliative care aspects. <clears throat> so we have a, a, a program in the curriculum that we've developed that looks into all of this. We even, in our uh, fellowship in geriatrics, we have the fellow rotate on hospice. And also the hospice fellows rotate through geriatrics because we consider it that important that they need to learn both aspects because unfortunately, most people that end up on hospice are older. And especially when you deal with those with underlying dementia and other problems that come along with getting old, as I know myself. So these are the things that we, uh, we uh, teach and uh, very carefully to teach the uh, fellows in hospice the aspects of geriatrics that I talked about are most important, and those that are in geriatrics, those aspects of understanding end of life and palliative care. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to all the speakers. Thank you, Dr. Lalit, Dr. Ashish. And uh, we go on to the next question now. And uh, the next session, I think we, it's 9.34, so we need to go on to the next session. Thank you very much. We will take the next one now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you.